morning. I hope you like the kids' music in the background. <laughs> Has it been a while since you heard bingo? Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Nina. Hi, Mom. I'm prepared with snacks to shove in their faces. <laughs> Nina, I got your email. Your description of toddlers was so funny. I... I couldn't stop laughing. It was hilarious. Flinging fruit and running around. <laughs> Jumping on tables. and The mental image was so perfect. Okay. They're quiet for the moment, so let's jump right in. Hey, Roseanne, your daughter's adorable. I saw your Facebook post. They're so cute. Hi, Linda. Good morning. Oh, she's super cute. Good morning, good morning. Oh, I bet. <laughs> the fun ones are always a handful. You're back. Susan, I messaged you on Facebook. I don't know if you check your Facebook messages very often. I sent it last night. Let's just jump right in while we have a moment of quiet. Hello. Okay. I'm just going to go for it. Oh, good. I'm putting the materials for your daughter in in the next couple of weeks. Let's see. We're on 55 already. Yeah, while they're being quiet, I'm just going to jump right in. And hello to replay viewers and web viewers and people coming in and people already here. Hey, Michelle. The sign of the mysterious. We're on 55. It's just, this one's interesting already. <laughs> being full of power is like being a baby. Scorpions don't sting. Tigers don't attack. Eagle, e eagles don't strike. Soft bones, weak muscles, but a firm grasp. Ignorant of the intercourse of man and woman, yet the baby penis is erect. True and perfect energy. All day long screaming and crying, but never getting hoarse. True and perfect harmony. Awkward. <laughs> Her notes say, as a model for the Taoist, the baby is in many ways ideal. Totally unaltruistic, not interested in politics, business, Trump or Cruz. <laughs> Weak, soft, and able to scream for hours without wearing itself out. Its parents are another matter. That is so true. The baby's unawareness of poisonous insects and carnivorous beasts means that such dangers simply do not exist. Again, its parents are a different case. As a metaphor of the Tao, the baby embodies the eternal beginning, the ever-springing source. We come trailing clouds of Glory, Wadsworth said, and Hopkins, there lives the dearest, freshness, deep down things. And I didn't read the whole thing. I've gotten so used to them being one page that it actually continues on the other page. So hold on just a second and I'll read the rest of it. So there's no Peter Pan refusal to grow up, no hunt for the fountain of youth. What is eternal is forever young and never grows old. But we are not eternal in, um, in the sense of our physical selves. It is in this sense that I understand how the natural, inevitable cycle of youth, growth, mature vigor, age, and decay can be not the way. The way is more than the cycle of any individual life. We rise, flourish, fail. The way never fails. We are the waves and it is the sea. That's a great way to see it. We're the movement of it of the sea itself. So the verse that I skipped, and sorry about that, so I'll back up just a little bit. True and perfect energy, all day long screaming and crying but never getting hoarse. True and perfect harmony. To know harmony is to know what's eternal. To know what's eternal is enlightenment. I, I would agree with that. Increase of life is full of portent. The strong heart exhausts the vital breath. The full grown is on the edge of age, not the way. What's not the way soon dies. 
And that is true. Waves rise and fall. They live and die, if you want to think of it that way. But the ocean itself doesn't. So the, what animates our bodies doesn't die. Um, but our bodies do. So that's what they're talking about. That's the mysterious stuff is understanding that we're we are the sea and we're in motion but that part that's in motion comes and goes oh boy okay <laughs> i'm just gonna go right on to the second book periscope's being really weird like the numbers on the right are just going up and down and up and down it's really strange it was probably the baby penis. Everyone was like, whoa, stop it. Shut the front door. I'm out of here. It's kind of what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, 55. <laughs> it's just weird how the numbers are like up and down. Okay, he who is in harmony, he, he who is in harmony with the Tao is like a newborn child. Its bones are soft, its muscles are weak, but its grip is powerful. It doesn't know about the union of male and female, yet its penis can stand erect. So intense is its vital power. It can scream its head off all day, yet it never becomes hoarse. So complete is its harmony. The master's power is like this. He lets all things come and go effortlessly without desire. He never expects results, thus he is never disappointed. He is never disappointed, thus his spirit never grows old. Oh, I was just complaining about Periscope being glitchy again. Sorry about that. I don't, I started really quickly too, Catherine, because the babies are actually being quiet, so I thought I better take advantage of it. Um, I like that last part. He lets all things come and go effortlessly without desire in the sense of grabby kind. Me too. He never expects results, thus he is never disappointed. He's never disappointed, thus his spirit never grows old. When you don't understand how this stuff works, how the world itself works, you're constantly disappointed and crushed by outside events. And that is what ages people, I believe. I believe that's why you can get some 60-year-olds who are pretty bouncy and other 60 year olds who are you know one foot in the grave already it's the level of disappointment in their i believe in their understanding of how it how it works because if you don't understand that um if you don't understand the story part then the constant disappointment and the constant perception of failure is exhausting here you go it just wears you out so it crushes your spirit, and that's reflected in the body, um, where the body is just deteriorating. Because the same two six-year-olds can have issues with their body, but their spirit makes a difference in how they look and their energy levels and st all that stuff. Um, my dad, despite all his problems, as he was when he was sixty, was. Um, still curious about life, still learning, still, um, I was going to say energetic, but he has some chemical assistance with that. So he can't really, I don't really know what his natural energy level would have been, but he, um, was still talkative and still interested in the world as a whole. Whereas, yeah, my, oh, that's sad because of her attitudes. Whereas my stepfather-in-law, my father-in-law, who's Heath's stepdad. Yeah, he loved learning new things. So Heath's stepdad is only like a year older than what my dad was. So he's uh, just in his 60s, early 60s. And he looks like he's 80 years old. You will be. What's the matter? Here, you need a refill? Here you go. Here you go. Here. Nope. Nope. Um, he's completely, uh, he has stopped learning. And I think that's critical to staying as, you know, young 
and in connection with the energy of source. If you stop learning, then I really think your mind starts to deteriorate pretty rapidly and your interest in the world just wanes. And I think that puts you on a faster track to death. I mean, that's just my opinion. I don't have anything to base that on except watching people age and myself um, getting older. So, uh, so Heath's dad doesn't do anything. He goes to work. He watches TV. Yeah, it's really sad. He doesn't read. He doesn't, um, he doesn't even watch like new TV shows. Yeah, when you stop growing, you start dying. I, I absolutely believe that true. Age from boredom, not use. Yeah, and you grow by learning. Absolutely. I really believe that's true. So I think that, you know, the book is important today in that, you know, we can retain that openness of a baby. We can retain that connection and harmony with energy. When we're in harmony with everything going on around us, our energy is much higher. Um, letting things come and go. Well, <laughs> those, those are pretty good. Um, at least Big Bang is a new show, uh, relatively speaking. Heath's stepdad watches old shows and news, and that's it. He doesn't. He won't even watch anything like a new TV show or a movie or something. He's very... And it's just weird. The contrast between the two was so different. Where are you stashing these? She keeps coming back for these little veggie straws. <laughs> Hi, Betty. Here. Uh, who wouldn't? Uh, she's beautiful. Here you go, Ashlyn. Here you go. One more? You don't have to shove. She has the, shoves the whole thing in her mouth before. Here you go. They're eating these little veggie stars, which aren't great, but I suppose they could be worse. Judge Judy and everything related to it. So, uh, divorce court and court TV and um, all those things. <laughs> Does she yell at the TV? Anyway, that stuff will get you old quick, I think. Better pick up a book and read it now and then. <laughs> Find something new. Let's talk about Byron Katie. Let's talk about her. Let's talk smack about her. <laughs> Let's not. That's rude. Ah, of course she does. Um, she probably thinks it's real. Sorry if that's loud. We've got entertainment going on down here. The spinny thing is fun. We got one in her pajamas still because she flat out will not let me dress her. And I'm not interested in fighting that battle yet. <laughs> if ever. She might stay in her jammies all day. Hi, Erin. So we're on chapter 55. She lets all things come and go effortlessly. Anyone in harmony with what is has no past to project as a future. So there's nothing she expects. Whatever appears is always fresh, surprising, obvious, and exactly what she needs. She sees that it's a gift that she has done nothing to deserve. She marvels at the way of it. She doesn't make a distinction between sound and no sound, speaking of it or living it, seeing or being, touching or feeling it touch her. Life is her own love story. For her, everything is new. She's never seen it before. So this is like the don't know mind or beginner mind. We run across that concept in Buddhism, approaching life with beginner mind so that you never get immune to the beauty no, that no, surrounds you. When we That's first, uh, I never That's took the mountains in Colorado for granted. Or actually, yeah. nothing in my, I don't take anything in my environment for granted. I always look at nature with... Um, gratitude and it's always different what? even the same tree in your yard is a little bit different there's a different bird in it there's a slight different color to it um, observing those things really relaxes me so always treating your view of the mountains or your view of the world as new as something to look at with curiosity to see if there's anything different from the day before no two sunsets are the same. That kind of thing. Let's see. Okay. 
It is the innocence of not knowing in the wisdom in the wisdom of not needing to know. We don't have to know everything. She can see that everything as it appears in the moment is always benevolent. She lets all things come because they're going to come anyway. It's not as if she has a choice. She lets all things go because there they go, with or without her consent. And isn't that true? Things come and we don't really have a lot of control over it. And when it's time for people, places, and things to go, they go. And if we cling on to it, we cause ourselves and the people around us a lot of injury sometimes. She delights in the coming and going. Nothing comes until she needs it. Nothing goes until it's no longer needed. She's very clear about this. Nothing is wasted. There's never too much or too little. For myself, I struggle with letting things go because I don't 100% trust the process that there'll be something coming in behind it. Sometimes something leaves your life, a job or a person or a situation, and there's a little time delay before the new shows up. And I, even though I've experienced it lots of times, that when something leaves, something new comes in behind it, there's still a part of me that's suspicious that maybe this time that process won't work. So it's a little paranoid part of me that has trouble letting go because of lack of trust in that process. That, and it's, it always, of course, it, you know, nature hates a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. When something leaves, something comes to replace it. But we have to be centered and stable in the uncertainty of the in-between. Well, we don't have to, but it works better if we do. <laughs> she doesn't expect results because she has no future. She realizes the efficiency, the necessity of the way of it, how full it is, how rich beyond any concept she could have of what it should be. It being whatever, reality. In that realization, her life is always renewed. She herself is the way of it, always opening to what comes, always contented. If we, if we 100% trusted life and the process of it and the wave-like nature of it coming and going, we wouldn't freak out so much. We wouldn't freak out when, when our stuff isn't here as fast as we think it should be. And we wouldn't freak out when something leaves. Of course, in death, we're going to have a grieving process. And there's going to be... There's going to be that stuff to go through when we lose a person or a pet. Um, that's not what I'm talking about, unless it just goes on forever. You have to grieve the losses. I think to not grieve losses, even if it's just a job or um, a vehicle getting stolen or something, to not allow the grieving process actually prevents what's coming in from coming in behind it. Whatever's coming in to replace it or add depth to your life again is delayed, I think, if we don't fully grieve and close the door of what just left. Does that make sense? Like we lose a job, we need to grieve that. Even if we left it on our own volition, we still have to acknowledge that Maybe it's the chapter's ending. We have to acknowledge that that chapter has ended and there may be a time delay before we start the new chapter. This? I'm not picking it up. Thank you. Nope. Oh no, we're not taking that off. They like playing with the bottles of oils, but now they decide they want the lids off. We're not, we're not taking lids off. <laughs> Let me get paper and pens. Nope, not taking it off. You can play with the bottle, but we're not taking the lid off. Does that make sense to you that you have to say goodbye to stuff that's left or leaving before? Yeah. To ease the way of stuff coming in. Here you go. Look at this. Whoa. And your own pen and your own piece of paper. Yeah. I think part of the, our problem even with our kids is we don't uh, acknowledge their change from one stage of life to another. And we don't let ourselves say 
goodbye Dad. to the toddler Dad. to welcome the preschooler. Dad. Yeah, yes, yeah, definitely the same. They're in pretty good moods today. They seem to. They have a little language and they, they talk to each other and they, you know, they go back and forth. It looks like a conversation. It sounds like a conversation. I think they, I think they understand what they're saying. They're talking quite a bit more. She actually talks quite a bit just to herself. <laughs> so let's see if you can see her. She's busy with that tent, having a conversation about it. Keith brought them that. But it stays down all the time. <laughs> Do you want it set up? You okay? Diaper butt. She won't let me put her pants on. Tents are great for imagination. <sighs> I don't really have a lot today. I talked a lot yesterday. We went like well over an hour yesterday. And then, uh, I don't know how you guys slept last night, but we slept horribly. We kept waking up, and even when we were asleep, we were aware that we were asleep. It's like our minds never shut down. So all night, Heath and I were like, are you still awake? And we were like, Yeah. And then I was like, why aren't we sleeping? <laughs> Maybe it's because it's approaching a full moon. It was rough. Oh, it was terrible. I'd fall asleep. I could feel my body was asleep. Oh, but my mind was awake still. Like lucid dreaming? Nope, we're not taking the lids off. Here, you can have a, you can have a bag of these veggie straws if you'd like. Yeah, I was aware I wasn't sleeping. You guys slept like logs. Oh, because you were exhausted. Oh, wow, yeah. Weird dreams. Yeah, I don't even remember dreaming. Just aware that I was not... Aware that my body was sleeping, but my mind was awake and aware. But not with anything profound. Like you hear... Um, Hi, Cynthia! You hear people say, uh, talk about lucid dreaming. Um, oh, weird dreams too. Hi, Cynthia. We were just talking about how a lot of us didn't sleep very well last night. How did you sleep last night? I do too. And it was all night long, flopping around and tossing and turning. So hopefully tonight is better. Oh, good. Good. Uh, could have been better. Yeah, definitely had a lot of better night's sleep. Better night's sleep than last night, so. I don't really have much unless you guys have questions. Hi, Tanya. It's going to be a short scope today. I don't have much to say. The readings were pretty short, and I really love these books a lot. I kind of wish they were longer. We're, we're more than halfway. Yeah. Can't be on all the time. Right now? Is your sister Shelly there right now? Hi, Shelly. We love your sister. Oh, you don't remember. She said, don't tell yourself stories. Tanya, I hope she can catch the replay from yesterday because today my energy is a little bit low. Hi, Sarah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um... So, Tanya's in Chattanooga. That's only an hour and a half from me. Oh, yeah, catch. Um, I guess what I like so much about today, I'm wrapping up. I, I didn't have a lot. I jumped right in really quick because of the babies were being good or quiet. I hate to call them good and bad. Uh... felt like we had to take advantage of it. <laughs> so I didn't mess around as much as I usually do. You're welcome. Do you guys have questions? It's pretty straightforward today. Let things... I mean, Tosha Silver has that change me prayer. Change me into someone who lets what wants to come, come. 
and lets what wants to go go with ease and trust. It's a trust issue if you're clinging to things that are trying to leave until they get forced out of your hands. We've experienced that before where we knew we were supposed to leave something or someone or a job or whatever and we didn't. And so then it gets taken and you don't have any control over it. You get those little hinty things like, hmm, something needs to change here. Or maybe it's time to go. And then we ignore it. And then we get fired or, you know, laid off or something horrible happens. I haven't been fired, but I've sure seen it happen. Yeah, it's definitely trust. You don't trust that you can find another job. You don't trust that you can find another love. Um, you don't trust that you can find more money. So then you're too tight with everything. You're just living a tight ass existence, <laughs> which is no way to live. <laughs> so, I actually don't know anyone who spends much without some anxiety. Clinging to something that left six years ago that's still very painful. So then you can do a worksheet on that and ask yourself, <laughs> yeah. um, Betty, ask, ask yourself what your story is about that incident from six years ago and ask yourself if it's, if you're at least willing to take a look at letting that go and letting that heal. Boy, we can really hang on to stuff for a long time. I, I know. I definitely know. I've done it. Leaving a job before having another one is very scary. Yeah. Leaving a job and knowing you're not going to pick up another one and you're going to launch a, a workshop business instead is also scary. <laughs> uh, without Periscope, I probably would have had to pick up some traditional job again uh, in addition to the daycare. You 110% need to do that right now. Well, I get scared. I get scared a lot. I just have learned not to let it stop me. I, I get really scared about stuff, but I just know that if I stop, then I might not start again. So it's like what, once I get... <laughs> once I get momentum going, I got to keep going. If I put the brakes on, I might not put the gas back on. Because then fear can just, like, overtake you and tie you up in knots and you can't get anything done. Um, was, there's several military books and military, um, what am I talking about? Strategy, where you've got to worry about the soldier who's not scared. Because they're sociopathic. <laughs> You should be scared of war of any kind. You should be scared of new things. That's normal. If you're absolutely 100% unafraid, you've got some kind of personality disorder going on, and that's... Yes, it totally will. It will totally help you figure out what the next step is. You won't, actually won't even have to figure it out. It will become clear to you without so much effort. But you're staying in Utah? Is that the plan? Right, right. Yeah, family stuff. Um, sometimes we temporarily have to be places we'd rather not be because of overriding need of the people that we love and what they're going through. So we suck that part up and do the best we can to be happy in where we're at. While we're, while we're supporting family members who really, really need help. Right. When I worked in Cheyenne, Cheyenne is a, Cheyenne, Wyoming is an interesting place. Let's just say it that way. Um, Morgan says we need to put a big fence around Wyoming and treat it like we used to treat Australia or like England used to treat Australia and ship everybody there that's socially deviant. <laughs> Just put a big fence around the state. There's only like a uh, hundred and what? It's some ridiculously low population. It's really, really low population because there's 
there's nothing there. There's a lots of wind and some bison. And a penal colony. Yeah, she was. She thinks we. You thought we already did. We kind of did. <laughs> So driving back and forth from Cheyenne was an interesting experience too because trucks literally do blow over and you'll come up on them if they've just blown over and they, well, that makes sense. <laughs> and they, the truck is just laying on the side of the road. Good morning, Tina. The trucks just blow over in the median or right on the highway. And I had one passing me once and it's trailer tipped. Right as it passed me, its trailer went boink and then bounced back up. And I was like, Whoa! it was terrifying. Yes, Nebraska too. Um, the eastern plains of Colorado, the, the wind blows all the time. So I used to ask people like, why does anyone live in Nebraska? Where at? I have a cat from Ogallala. <laughs> and a... Very good friend of mine, Bev Harris, is from Ogallala, Nebraska. And then my stepdad, stepfather-in-law's kids live in, um, starts with an S, can't remember. Lincoln, okay. I went to a training in Omaha. The drive from Colorado across Nebraska to Omaha was um, horrific, too. The scenery never changes, and so you feel like you're just like caught in a twilight zone of a highway that never ends. But I used to ask people, like, why do you stay in Cheyenne? It's horrible here. It's horrible. There's nothing here. The wind blows all the time. It's tan. It's just varying shades of beige. It's just awful. In the north part and in the wildlife. I liked, that's what I had to do is find some redeeming qualities. It's looking for when you're in an environment that's not your preferred environment and it's not what generally supports you, you have to do what Aaron just said. You have to look for, I'm sure some people do. You have to look for the whatever you can find to keep you going. So when I would ask people, why do you live here? Most of them said family. There was some familial relationship reason for staying in Cheyenne. And so, um, they had already done that, and then I had to learn to do that, to find the redeeming qualities of Wyoming. So I was driving from Fort Collins to Cheyenne, which is a, about an hour, and so I started to appreciate the open space. It's wide open. There's nothing. There's no buildings. There's The highways are always, there's no traffic. Um, and then when I started, stopped being grumpy about it and started looking for the redeeming qualities. Yes, you just have to find a different path while you're there. Yeah. So then I noticed the herds of antelope and then I noticed the small herds of bison. And then I noticed the occasional herd of elk and an amazing amount of hawks. And in the spring, antelope babies were running around. And so eventually I looked forward to my drive up there. And I looked, um, and actually at one crazy point considered moving up there. And then I was like, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, the sun shines in Colorado all the time too. Like 300 days of sun in that area. Yeah, there's lots of sage. Wyoming on that drive has some really beautiful outcroppings of rock, like big prehistoric. I mean, that used to be underwater. So there's fossils and all kinds of stuff. But it's the same wherever we're at. Even if we're in an environment that's beautiful, if we aren't looking for the things to appreciate, then we miss it. We miss it. We get grumpy. Well, it comes and goes. <laughs> They actually do spend a lot of time looking for asking that question, how can I see this differently? And then my follow-up question, is love available even here? No doubt. I don't live in Texas for a reason. Wow. Oh, she's super excited over there. You know why? Because she's messing up the TV. She's got hold of the TV buttons in there. She's going to town. Yeah, you can get used to them. And if you don't daily take a beginner's mind approach, which brings us, I guess, full circle to where we started, is the baby. 
the baby mind, the don't know mind, the we get tunnel vision, we tend to look down a lot, and we forget that we're surrounded by mountains or we're surrounded by beautiful things that are a little bit different every day. Depending on what time of day you, um, excuse me, don't hit the TV. If you break that TV, your moms are just going to die. <laughs> Ashlyn, come here. Can you want to come get this? Here, baby. Look, you want to come get this? Come no. no, she's on to me. Chicago, yeah. So one thing that can help is treating your area like a tourist, like you just moved there, like you want to be there. You obviously want to be there. Some part of you wants to be there or you wouldn't be. So even if there's an over, the grass is always greener, definitely. Even if there's a, you know, a reason to be there. You're grumpy with Kentucky. <laughs> it does sound like, it does sound like country song. Hey, you should write that, send it to Taylor Swift, and then you will make a million dollars. A Canada makes you so happy. What part of Canada are you in, Tina? Because we're probably going to come be your neighbors. <laughs> Canada for president. <laughs> Alberta. Oh my gosh. We, uh, it's, everyone I know is jealous of Canadians. So just so you know, we love where you live, too. <laughs> uh, I have a friend who lives in Canada now. She's American, but she lives in Canada now and absolutely loves it. Ontario, I think she is at. I think she's in Ontario. That's a squirrel. Uh-oh. Chapel Hill over here on the East Coast. You're moving to Vancouver Island. Oh! Tina, stop. You're making me so jealous. Oh, that's cool. That's not very far from me. Vancouver Island is like the ultimate, isn't it? British Columbia, that whole area. And wait, Cynthia, are you still on here? She's over there on that side. You and Cynthia could meet up for coffee. Oh, Canada, we want to live with you, Tina and Cynthia. We want to come live with you and have free, better health insurance. <laughs> Tempting. Yes. See, you and Tina could be neighbors if she moves to Vancouver. Yeah, I don't know how the song goes. I can hear the lyrics in my head, and I don't know why, but I don't know how the music goes. The O Canada song. <laughs> so... When you're grumpy where you're at, which it sounds like a lot of you are, <laughs> look for the redeeming qualities. Look for the beauty. I know that Utah has a lot of uh, deficits, but it also has a lot of beauty. You grew up in northern New York. You learned the, the Canadian anthem and the U.S. anthem. That's so funny. And it's February. So February is a grumpy month, too. We're in between waiting for spring. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes all you can do is appreciate that uh, Moab, Utah is amazing. Yeah. Fun shit. Poop. Poo on it. January and February are hard. Yeah, just in general. So be kind. Be kind to yourself. She's in Austin. Which, I mean, I love Austin, but I wouldn't want to live in Texas again either. February does feel like the longest month. Yeah. Moab is a uh, outstanding, outstanding beauty. Outstandingly beautiful. And I've heard lots of good things about Salt Lake City other than the, you know, the proliferation of prejudice and whatnot. Yeah, I like Disney Texas, but I don't want to live there either. So, I mean, I had to do a lot of work on myself to move to Georgia to find some redeeming qualities about this part of the world. You're moving to Belize. Well, we're going to split our time between you and Tina and Cynthia. Oh, I see. You need to travel more. 
Uh, yeah, working for the government. That's too bad. I, I thought that sounded like, here, baby, here, Ashlyn. Do you see what she did? She did that thing again where she comes over, she asks for something. I've got a whole handful of what she wanted, but she's already running the other direction. Hey, there you go. Hey, say hello. Say hello. Can you say hi? You just want your veggie straws. You got them? Whoops, most of them are on the floor. Oh, now they're all on the floor. Oh well. The floor is fairly clean. <laughs> it was vacuum. There's a house appraiser coming, so actually I probably should should stop talking soon, but here you go. They taste better on the floor. <laughs> Yuck. They're so quiet that today, look. They got their mouths full of little chippy things. <laughs> they sound like little hamsters eating. Hey, little hamsters. Can you say hi? Say hi. Nope. Not interested. Can you say hi? Hey. Hey. What's that? What's that? <laughs> Don't they sound like hamsters eating carrots? Catch, 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 catch. Little floor hamsters, little toddler hamsters. So anyway, there you go. They act like drunk frat boys. They absolutely do. When they don't get what they want, they scream at the top of their lungs. They stagger around. They leave a trail of trash behind them. Oh, <laughs> I love the crunching sound too. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so take a look outside today with a beginner's mind. Pretend that you just woke up from a different life and now there's this whole new world out there for you to explore. Look at it as if you've never seen it before. Just see. Sometimes you can only get a moment of appreciation. Yes, that's exactly what they remind me of. There's a little hamster video running around where he's laying in his little hamster bed eating a carrot. Yes, yes, your parrot. <laughs> the little hamster video eating his carrot in bed is so adorable. So, yeah, that's all I got. Beginner's mind today. Beginner's mind. Don't know mind, beginner's mind, um, be a blank slate today. I do know from experience that multiple times when I've been in crappy shit situations that finding and writing down lists of appreciation, got it, check, um, shifted my situation pretty quickly once I could stop spending all my time um, complaining and feeling sorry for myself, which is my go-to familiar bad feeling when I get stressed out. Um, Self-pity is my go-to, yeah. Self-pity and sadness is my go-to familiar bad feeling. So under stress, that's the first place I go. So once I remembered this, I've done this multiple times. Oh, I bet. My friend Jenna and I spent 30 days making a hundred a list of 100 gratitudes every day together before we went home after work every day. So as soon as work ended, we'd meet in one of our offices and we'd write 100 things to be grateful for every day for 30 days. Yes, taking little trips help. I'm meeting Michelle and Tanya in person tomorrow. I'm super excited about that. I am a beginning toddler today. Good. Find something to crunch. Because crunching will make you happy. So tomorrow's scope will have a couple of guest stars on it. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to do it yet. And it probably will be late because I'll be driving. Yeah, gratitude journals are huge. I, I Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Because I will be on the road tomorrow. The scope pr will probably be before 12. But... Um, it might be later. I can't promise tomorrow's time tomorrow. Yay! After your good pity, yes, have a pity party and then start your gratitude list. Get the pity party out of your system. Then find things to be grateful for.
Good. It really helps. Anyway, after I started doing that pretty quickly, I got new job offers. Or I, you know, stumbled across leads that led me to new jobs. But it never would shift until I found things to appreciate where I was. Even in, and I was in government jobs at that point too. And they are horrible. Okay. I'm going to go feed these hamsters and wait for the house appraiser to get here and then take a nap. So I'll talk to you tomorrow. I don't know what time I will be here. just don't know what time it will be. Have a great day. Have a wonderful day. Love you guys. I'm grateful for you. <laughs> oh, did you guys hear that? Oh, looks like I got some diaper changing to do. I bet you're jealous, aren't you? Aren't you jealous that I have Lau, like a very loud diaper situation happening right here at the base of my chair? Yeah, I'll see you for reals tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, okay, bye.